Welcome to the NY Patriot Show. Today, I, I got a guest with me that has uh, been long overdue, uh, an excellent researcher and someone I always love having on, and has been uh, making her rounds on to other shows, which I think is great because uh, you know all the listeners have come across her and realized that she does uh, her research when she covers a topic. So it's nice to see you ending up on more shows as well, Mix. Um, for people who may not know who you are, because it's been a while since you've come on and maybe people haven't checked out the older episodes, can you please let people know like what your deal is and everything, who you are? So, yeah, sure. So, um, I'm Nix and if you're looking for me, um, you can find me on social media. I have an Instagram account and that's Nix N Y X period one, two, two, three. And then I'm also on X, formerly Twitter, and I, it's Nix, N-Y-X, one, two, two, three. And just over the years, um, I've gotten really interested in researching um, high strangeness. Um, I think it re- I really was bit by the bug um, when the um, virus started in 2020. Um, and I started just looking and listening to a lot of podcasts and um, going off, you know, some of the topics they talked about and starting to do my own research and I've continued to do that. And although I would love to have a podcast, um, I don't have a lot of time and the little time I do have, like my energy levels are de- depleting. So I enjoy being on other people's podcasts and presenting my research. Maybe one day I'll be able to have a podcast, but at this time um, it's just, it, it just wouldn't work well. And I am the type of researcher where I am very anal retentive and a perfectionist <laughs> and I completely stress myself out. Um, so it, it, you know, it would be a once in a while podcast because I wouldn't be putting them out super frequently because You'd be of the editing reasons. the same one for like the, the three months straight. <laughs> right. right. So, um, but yeah, I do enjoy researching and talking about, um, you know, conspiracy topics of high strangeness, um, biblical um, prophecy or eschatology, um, cryptids, you know, anything weird and unusual, um, I do enjoy talking about. And you can find on my social media a lot of these topics being covered. Um, and that's where I put out my research. Yeah, I highly suggest for people to go check out your uh, your Instagram and your Twitter. My opinion, you know, you actually have amazing posts. Oh, thank you. You know, like <laughs> I, I do think... Um, you know, there's only so much you can do on social media, you know, but I do think uh, you do a good job at the little tidbits that you try to drop. So I, I do suggest yeah. people to go check out your social media. I think when you do posts, they're solid posts with information, yeah. multiple pictures. It's, you know, you do a yeah, good job. And I do try to like, you know, create my own content when I do my research. I try to find pictures and, you know, edit them with captions and um, kind of explain to people what I'm talking about so they can follow, follow along. Cause sometimes, um, some people will post something without any context to it. And, I, and I'll be oh, like, I do I, that I, I, I'm, not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'll look at it. I'm like, I'm not following. I need more information on this, but I always try to, um, you know, put information into it and explain it to people so they can know what I'm talking about. But, um, all my content, I try to, you know, create from scratch. I might use photos I find on the internet, but I, create them and caption them accordingly to um, the research I'm posting. Mm, yeah, no, you, you do a really good job. You know, one thing I, I have uh, just thought about why it was while you were talking now, um, you, you ever think of doing a blog? I've thought about that actually. And I'm like, and I was wondering, like, I wonder how many people like read blogs, you know, um, regularly. Cause uh you know, obviously I wouldn't want to put a lot of that, uh, time and effort out there if people, you know, weren't really reading blogs. I know I read some blogs. I I think one of the people's blogs I read is, um, recluses from the farm. He's got a lot of interesting, um, stuff. He's a really good researcher too. Um, I I don't know how he has the capacity to know everything he does (laughs) know. Um, but I have thought about a blog before. I guess I just was wondering, you know, how many people would be interested in, you know, in that content, you know, if there'd be enough to put it out there. 
Yeah, no, I just thought about it because there's a few people I even uh, know that that write blogs and uh, you know, mm-hmm. just you know that even do podcasting. And it was just a, a thought, you know, maybe maybe a blog would be easier for you if you yeah, ever thought of it, it's well, worth doing. I could probably still do my post and then for you know any further additional information. That's that what I was thinking. Fit, fit into a post because I have a plethora of information um, that they can maybe click on a link and continue to see um, the topic discussed. Yeah. in a longer format that you know social media might not allow yeah exactly like, i can't tell you how upset i get that uh twitter limits my characters oh my god it drives <laughs> and me then nuts. it limits you to only four pictures and then what i like about instagram is i think when you add music to a post it can make the post especially if you're discussing uh you know conspiracy and you know uh in the music industry and stuff like i just did recently i i've been de-occulting red hot chili peppers a little bit i love i Um, love that you were doing that i saw some of that stuff uh, and i i that was my favorite band growing up and i still love them very dearly i i'm not crazy about the music they're putting out now but they're old stuff like i love so like you know putting music to a post i think can really like you know um just give him a little bit of that extra oomph and you know um to uh, reach people and just make it better content. But I felt like a couple times, like making a post and uh, tagging Elon Musk in it and be like, um, excuse me, if you want to be better than Mark Zuckerberg, can you please, <laughs> that can is you please true. allow us to like post more pictures and let us have music. And like, even the videos were limited. Like I, I did a video um, of my great grandparents finding out they were involved in the occult and it was telling me, oh, you can't post this video. It's too long. So I had to do it in segments. And I was like, what the heck, man? I'm like, I'm like, get with it, Elon Musk. You want to like, you're talking about how great you're going to make Twitter and stuff. And like, there's a lot of things about like. It's just Instagram. small little stupid things that if you was to yeah. change, it would make it better. Right? Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, so yeah, that does get irritating at times when you're limited on what you can do with your content. Exactly. Um, so this topic, I think I, uh, I came across because I think I actually saw that you covered this on, uh, subconscious realms on Lee show. Yes. And I saw that was the, the topic. first one I covered it on. Yeah. yeah. And I saw, I saw that and I was like, Oh, that caught my eye and I had hit you up and I asked if, you know, you'd be willing to come on and repeat yourself again. And, uh, you said, yeah. So, um, basically I guess, I mean, you're covering kind of the Vatican, correct? Yeah, the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church and how, you know, a lot of evidence suggests that it's rooted in paganism. So um, during my research, I came across what's known as religious syncretism, and it's the amalgamation or attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought, and it's the practice of merging and combining different beliefs in various schools of thought. So um, you can see on the left there, I kind of um, give a little bit of detail on, on it, but it seems like the combining of two religions. And this started happening back in the time of Constantine and has kind of continued on throughout um, Isn't the, the sorry Roman to interrupt Catholic you. history. What's doesn't that? the word Catholicism in itself almost mean like, uh I, amalgamation like bringing things together i would have to look into that that didn't come across in my research yeah. but i could be wrong um i guess you know part of me you know it's like when i researching this topic topic it's like okay so when the church was first started was this a way they wanted to try to like draw pagans in and they would be like well you can still have this if you become a christian or is it a religion rooted in, in an esoteric way in a Babylonian religion. Um, so, and, and that's what people are going to have to kind of um, decide for themselves uh, or an opinion. I don't think we'll ever really know. And when I cover this topic, you know, I don't want anyone who's Catholic to think I'm picking on them. This is more, uh, uh, you know, at the creation of the religion and, and the intent of it. Um you know, my, I have a lot of um, family members and friends are Catholic, and I love them dearly. And, you know, I'm not saying anybody has to believe this, because this is all, like, speculation, but there is a lot of interesting coincidences. And, you know, how many coincidences does it take before you start really questioning, you know, the purpose of something? But I think it's at least worth looking at and seeing 
a lot of the examples of religious syncretism I'm going to be speaking about during this podcast. Yeah. So. I'm sure um, there is. I mean, just real quick, not to keep interrupting, but like. No, 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 at all. Go today, ahead. after this, I'm doing a live show covering saints that were, you know, they're, they're saints and they're occultists and mystics. Mm -hmm. You know, from, from yeah. going back in time, it looks like at some point the church actually entertained all of this stuff. And yeah, then something um, happened. I don't know what happened, but now all of a sudden this stuff is not, you know, like going by stuff that I was coming across from like, you know, 1,000 or 1,200s. Everything mm -hmm. like science, occult, like science and music, like everything was a part of a whole. Mm-hmm. They believed all these things all made up, like, I guess, existence or reality. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, it wasn't so much, like, fragmented and one had nothing to do with the other. It's just weird looking at how they studied and how they learned, especially people involved with Catholicism. And then, like, all of a sudden, it's just like, nope, that's not what this is about. It's just very mm -hmm. weird. It just doesn't yeah. make sense. And when you talk about the saints, um, I haven't, I've, I've come across this, I haven't, dives into it yet because there's been like just a million you know subtopics coming to me at once over this but i believe i read somewhere that constantine actually um took a lot of the pagan gods and goddesses and you know renamed them you know with a saint mm. so yeah there is some correlation between um saints and paganism and the old pagan gods and goddesses so, but, um, so yeah, so first of all, I'm going to start with Constantine. Um, some of this might be a little bit dry at times, but in order to, you know, start going in the direction, a lot of the things we're going to be talking about with religious syncretism, we have to go back to Constantine because that's, that's where it started. So, um, prior to Constantine's conversion, he followed the Roman imperial cult, and that was a cult that identified emperors and some members of their family with uh, divinely sanctioned authority of the Roman state. So during Constantine's reign, which was from 306 to 337 AD, Christianity began to transition to the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. And historians remain uncertain as to what his reasons were for favoring Christianity why theologians, uh, theo theologians and historians have argued about which form of early Christianity he subscribed to. But Constantine ruled the Roman Empire as a sole empire for much of his reign, and some scholars allege that his main objective was to gain uh, unanimous approval and submission <laughs> to his authority from all classes. So therefore, he chose Christianity to conduct his uh, political propaganda believing that it was the most appropriate religion that could fit with the Roman imperial cult. So. Yeah, it's fine. I feel like even the right does that a lot with Catholicism and Christianity now. Mm -hmm. I feel like they, they push that they are that because they know people will. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. They, they think it gives them this um, good, wholesome image. So whether Constantine truly converted to Christianity or remained loyal to paganism is a much debated topic amongst historians. His formal conversion in 312 AD is almost universally acknowledged among historians, despite the claim Constantine was baptized on his deathbed in 337 AD. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there's some speculation on that, and some of the evidence I'm going to present is going to you know, show why exactly... Um, you know, people were like, I'm, they weren't completely convinced that he con converted. So according to Hans Polsander, a professor of history at the University of Albany, Constantine's conversion was just another instrument instrument of re real politic in his hands meant to serve his political interest in keeping the empire united under his control. His decision to halt the persecution of Christians uh, in the Roman Empire was a turning point for early Christianity sometimes referred to as the triumph of the church, the peace of the church, or the Constantine shift. So in February 313 AD, Constantine and Licinius issued the Edict of Milan, which was an agreement that dis decriminalized Christian worship and people were to treat Christians benevolently within the Roman Empire. 
Now, this gave Christianity legal status and reprieve from persecution, but it did not make it the state religion of the Roman Empire. That didn't occur until 380 AD with the Edict of Thessalonica. So Eusebius um, was a historian bishop and was credited with writing Constantine's biography, Life of Constantine. In the biography, Eusebius recounted prior to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, which happened on October 28, 312 AD, Constancy saw a vision of a cross-shaped trophy formed from the light above the sun at midday and a text attached to it, which said, by this conquer. So um, I'm not going to read the Greek words here because I oh, don't, don't even, even read yeah. Greek, <laughs> but they're often rendered also in a Latin version in the, in this sign conquer or in this sign you will conquer. And according to Eusebius, Constantine also had a dream that same night. And in the dream, the Christ of God appeared to him with the sign which had appeared in the sky and urged him to make himself a copy of the sign which had appeared in the sky and to use this as protection against the attacks of the enemy. So writing his church history shortly after 313, Eusebius makes no mention of this story in that work and does not recount it until composing his posthumous uh, biography of Constantine a decade afterwards in the life of Constantine, which was written by Eusebius after Constantine had died. And Eusebius admitted that he had heard the story from Constantine long after it happened in 325 AD. So there's another um, scholar, I'm not sure if I'm going to say his name right, but Lactantius, and he wrote, um, was writing between 313 and 315 AD, and around 20 years before Eusebius's um, life of Constantine. He also doesn't mention a vision in the sky, but instead he mentions only that Constantine's dream took place on the eve of the climatic battle on the Moluvian Bridge across the Tiber with the crucial detail that the sign was marked on the Constantinian soldier's shields. And according to Lactinius, Constantine was advised in a dream to mark the heavenly sign of God on the shields of his soldiers and then engage in the battle. He did as he was commanded and by means of a letter X turned sideways with the top of its head bent around. He marked Christ on their shields. Armed with the sign, they took up their weapons. So Constantine's vision or and, and dreams, they didn't come out until well after um, the battle on the Maluvian Bridge. So that that's interesting and in that he could have um, created the story over the years and later recounted it uh, to these uh, writers like Eusebius who wrote his biography. So that is suspicious. Um, that it wasn't mentioned until way later on. Yeah, no, I understand that. I understand what you're getting at. You know, it's something yeah. I've even thought of too. Like you were saying before, like uh, possibly baptized. You know, someone being mm-hmm. baptized on their right. deathbed. You know, if if I'm just again, I'm going by what the TV shows me. Mm-hmm. If if it's like you know, Game of Thrones. You watched Game of Thrones. I I saw the first season. I didn't uh, see the other ones. So I mean, like if if it's if it was really like that at some point when it came to like being in charge or in power, like it, there's only so many people in a room when somebody that high up is dying. Mm-hmm. There's right. only so many people that are actually going to be there and, and you're going to have a doctor that's probably going to okay. sign off and then agree to whoever is telling the crowd or the people so-and-so has died. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really don't know. First off, no. if, if you don't know you don't know if the queen actually popped out his son or not. Because mm-hmm. if you have enough money, the doctor will lie for you, too. Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> you don't Absolutely. know if somebody really died or not, because everybody there mm-hmm. could just be in. So I, I do think when it comes to, like, monarchies and even, like, you know, just people that who are, I mean, even now, to tell you the truth, people who are in power, they are not in the society and living with us. Oh, for sure, yeah. We they're, have they're no in ideas. In a different world. Sometimes I just don't think like you know how truthful is like even history in itself. Oh yeah, no, because for of sure. like you I know, mean, because of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, and as like I stated earlier, um, 
you know, with Constantine's um, legalizing Christianity, he seemed to have done it not because so much of his conversion, but because it was his political agenda to accommodate Christianity, which was growing at the time, although, you know, many people were still practicing it in private. So, but he didn't make it the state religion either. So, you know, he didn't offend, you know, any of the pagans. So it seemed to be a political move in order to um, accommodate both religions um, and not piss anybody off. From what I was thinking before, I was like, this was probably just a political move because he knew there was so many of them. Some of them are, you know, they're being persecuted. Oh, for sure. At one point, mm-hmm. like, it was very occult to where, like, they had, like, their own little symbols on their houses to let each other know that they were Christians. They had their own mm-hmm. shit they draw in the sand in front of each other. They'd make the fish with a stick in the sand or something. Mm-hmm. So it's like you're kind of, like, finding a base that it's like, if I can pull this off, like, this might help my numbers. Right. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Like, and you're telling people I'm going to save you from being persecuted. Mm-hmm. I, that's and that's a big, you know, people, you know, are are going to want that. I mean, who wants to be persecuted? And the ways the Romans. It's like it's like um, Trump in China. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I will get into um, later on um, here uh, about the persecution that was happening to the Christians and why they are being persecuted, um, especially at the hands of Nero. So, um, let's see where I was at. Okay, so the Arch of Constantine um, depicts Constantine's victory over Maxentius at the Moluvian Bridge in 312 AD, and it was depicted in 315 AD and is situated between the Colosseum and Palatine Hill. Though dedicated to Constantine, much of the sculpture decoration consists of reliefs reliefs and statues removed from earlier triumphal monuments. No Christianity symbolism was found on it, which you think it would be in there given his vision. (laughs) But, you know, it wasn't depicted into the artwork until later. Uh, There were plenty of pagan elements in the movie and I'm sorry, in the Arch of Constantine, though. Um, they had, you know, the Magi wearing the Mithras hats. And if anybody doesn't know what the Mithras hat looks like, um, the best way I can describe it is it looks like a Smurf hat. Oh, that's a really good way to put that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so on the top of the arch, and you can see it in this um, slide here in the top picture, he had a bronze statue of himself riding in a chariot pulled by horses fashion in the same way Apollo is depicted. Now behind the arch and slightly off center was a huge statue of Apollo, which you can see it under that arch there. And it was slightly positioned off center so that when one was entering Rome, it looked like Apollo was watching over Constantine on the arch. However, when the sun would set, it would frame Apollo centered in the archway beneath Constantine. The bronze statue of Constantine that rested on top of the arch um, is no longer there. But it looked as though Constantine was above Apollo. So here you are going to see one of the first instances of Constantine portraying himself as a god and in some instances above, you know, the pagan gods. Now, I mean this doesn't seem like a Christian approach to things considering he's supposed to be, you know, converted to Christianity now. So that is suspect. Uh, it's all cult symbolism, I think. Yeah, for sure. Especially even picking bronze probably. Which was specific mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So um, the next um, piece is the Colossus of Constantine. Um, and it was created somewhere between 312 and 315 AD. It was a large sculpture of his head. Uh, which I think this probably shows a pretty good depiction of his personality. Um, But it had dowel holes in the sides of it for an insert, likely being that of a ray crown. This depiction would have given the impression that Constantine was giving himself the status of being a god, like Apollo or Mithras. So you can see on the picture on the right is where the uh, the dowel inserts were and um, how archaeologists believe that it was probably a ray crown um, insert that went on his head. 
So in 324 AD, after the Western and Eastern Roman empires were reunited, the ancient city of Byzantium was selected to serve as the new capital of the Roman Empire, and the city was renamed Nova Roma, or New Rome, by Constantine. On May 11th, 330 AD, in true Constantine fashion, it was renamed Constantinople and dedicated to Constantine. He never returned to Rome after. So Constantinople is now um, considered what is um, today Istanbul, Turkey. You know, Constantinople was really big with uh, people from the order of Quetzalcoatl. Really? Or people who are big into uh, Quetzalcoatl type stuff. Yeah, I had so noticed that. Like when I that's thing that uh, that's completely different continent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. Um, so the most dominant feature of Constantinople's skyline at the time was the Column of Constantine, and it was a giant column topped by a huge statue of Constantine, made to look like Apollo. Uh, during that time, people in Constantinople were worshiping the sun god Apollo. And the column was dedicated on May 11th, 330 AD, with a mixture of Christian and pagan elements. So here I'm going to touch on a little bit of that religious AD, syncretism. You said, you said 330? Yes. <laughs> 33. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's that number again. Nice. So um, the statue of Constantine was likely nude, and he was wearing a seven-point radiant crown, one of the ray crowns like um, they thought he was wearing in his... Um, big head picture and he was holding a spear and an orb it appeared or i'm sorry its appearance probably referred to the colossus of rhodes and to the colossus of nero in rome because they all resemble the solar de deities helios or apollo so the orb was said to contain a fragment of the true cross and at the foot of the column was a sanctuary which contained relics allegedly from the crosses of the two thieves who were crucified with Jesus Christ at Calvary, the basket from the loaves of bread and the miracle of the fish, an alabaster anointment jar belonging to Mary Magdalene who used it um, to anoint Jesus' head and feet, and the Palladium of ancient Rome, which was a wooden statue of Pallas Pallas Athena from Troy. So these are rumored items that were supposed um, to be incorporated in the column or beneath the column. And you can see it's, you know, a bunch of Christian and pagan elements again. So again, they're kind of combining those two religions. So yeah. over time, the statue sustained serious damage from massive earthquakes and devastating fires. And in 1106 AD, um, violent winds caused the statue to fall. Although the statue is gone, the column remained, which is under res uh, renovations. So one final note on the um, arch of Constantine, um, which I intentionally saved for last. The arch was constructed in close proximity to where the Flavian emperors, who the and the Flavian emperors were the ones who destroyed Jerusalem and the Holy Temple but in close proximity to where the Flavian Emperor's fountain used to stand um, was, was the, the arch. And Constantine would often call himself Flavian Constantine. So was this an esoteric way of Constantine saying he would outdo the Flavians by adopting Christianity and infiltrating it without having to fight in order to do so like the Flavian Emperors did? Because if you, when you look at this, if Constantine believed and placed himself above pagan gods and that he was a god to be worshipped, where does that leave Christianity? Mm. So it appears when Constantine legalized Christianity, it was being fused with paganism in order to win the trust and loyalty of Roman soldiers of various belief systems. So, you know, all of that is very interesting and when I look at that, that suggests to me he didn't have, he didn't convert to Christianity yet, or he didn't have a full conversion. He had his, you know, you know, he was on both sides of the fence, one foot on one side and mm -hmm. one on the other still. Or see, like, so sometimes then, I wonder, like, do they, do they just have a different opinion of what Catholicism and Christianity really was to begin with? Mm -hmm. Like, they, well, did they take like, it as it was pure occultism in the beginning? 
Yeah, and it seems like, you know, when you look at it, Constantine would would have been considered kind of the founder of or the start of the Roman church, Roman Catholic Church um, with having legalized and then um, everything and then um, the church picking up from there since it was legalized. Now they can, you know, uh, start and operate a church. So, you know, I just find it all completely suspect still. Um, mm. But I guess, you know, I don't know what their education, I guess, would have been on Christianity at the time it started. But you would think they'd want to have a kind of understanding before they start, like, I don't know, just erecting monuments that still have a bunch of pagan elements to them and stuff. Um, I don't know. It's it's very strange. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So I'm next going to move on to... Um, the Vatican St. Peter's Square obelisk, um, which is another very interesting piece um, that has a lot of religious syncretism to it. So in the middle of St. Peter's Square sits a 4,000-year-old uninscribed Egyptian obelisk of red granite. It stands 84 feet tall and is topped by a cross. So I'm sure many of your, your viewers are aware of what an obelisk is, but just to cover it real briefly for those who don't, um, it's a stone rectangular pillar with a tapered top forming a pyramidion set on a base erected to commemorate an individual or event and honor the gods. And the ancient Egyptians are created, or I'm sorry, credited for creating it. So it can symbolize um, the solar symbol, creation of life, resurrection and rebirth, unity and harmony, strength and immortality, success and effort, and everyone's favorite, um, the phallus symbol. So what's interesting um, is Rome has more standing obelisk from Egypt than anywhere else in the world, including Egypt. So there are eight ancient Egyptian obelisks there, five are ancient Roman um, for a total of 13, and it, that gives Rome the most obelisks in the world. <laughs> so that's, that's something it. actually very interesting. And to tell you the <laughs> truth, even like looking at that, this uh, St. Peter's obelisk, square obelisk, even just if you were to like knock down the obelisk, and you had what was on the floor there, that's like a whole other symbol from something else, too. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, we'll definitely get into that um, because there's some very interesting um, symbolism found in that square, and I'll be covering that here um, shortly. So it, the obelisk was originally erected in Heliopolis, Egypt, by the pharaoh Menacheres. Oh, that's um, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. According to Saint, and this is according to Saint Peter's Basilica's website. So, but it um, was uh, he erected it in 1835 BC. So, between 30 and 28 BC, the Emperor Augustus had it moved to the Julian Forum of Alexandria, where it stood until 37 AD, when Caligula ordered the forum demolished and the obelisk transferred to Rome. And originally he had it erected in his um, gardens he inherited from his mother. And then it was moved to the spina, um, which means spine, of a circus started by Caligula. And it was completed during Nero's reign. So the circus hosted chariot races, games, and the mass execution of Christians in 65 AD as scapegoats of the Great Fire of 64 AD. In Nero's attempt to rebuff the conspiratorial accusations that he was responsible for the fire. Before the fire, Nero had hoped to knock down a third of Rome in the hope of erecting a series of palaces and elaborate gardens adorned with monuments. He hoped to call the complex the Neropolis. Rome was to be rebuilt in his image. But the Senate rejected his plans, seemingly providing the tyrannical Nero with a motive to start the fire. And that's a, that's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down um, as to whether, I mean, fit, it, it's agreed on that he didn't himself physically start the fire, but <laughs> whether he had other people do it or not has remained a topic of speculation. Is or that what Billy who, Joel's song who, was about to begin with? We didn't, we didn't start, start the fire. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there's some, um, I'm sure the Christians were singing that as they were being persecuted. <laughs> there's a little bit of dark humor there. Um, right. So, let's see here. So historians have suggested that, that early Christians in Rome believed that the city was an evil place since they regarded the majority of its citizens um, to be pagan. And they prophesied the city would be set ablaze by a great inferno. So the Christians were seized and tortured into confessing. Then they were torn into pieces by dogs, crucified or burned alive, and used as human tiki torches at night. The circus was also the site of the apostles Peter and Paul's martyr martyrism or martyrdom. Peter, cruci Peter was crucified upside down due to his refusal that he was unworthy to be crucified upright the way Jesus Christ was. And I always found that interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of um, satanic sects and religions, they like to use the inverted cross. But I, I wonder how many of them know that that was a symbol of Peter saying he wasn't worthy to be to have the same death that Christ had and in, in the same manner. So basically that would be a symbol of, you know, I am not worthy like Christ is, you, you know? Um, so very it, much tarot it, like too. Huh? Tarot but, with the hangman is very much. Oh yes. Yes. So it's just interesting. I, you know, I wonder if most of them are, are, are familiar with that piece of history and if they would still want to, use the inverted cross, uh, knowing the history behind it. So, um, so the apostle Paul was beheaded. So the site for the crucifixions in the circus would have been a long spina as suggested by the second century acts of Peter, which is an apocryphal text. And it describes his spot of martyrdom as between the two ends of the circus. The obelisk remained standing at the center of the circus, the spina, until it was re-erected in St. Peter's Square in the 16th century, the year of 1586, by Sixtus V. So the circus was abandoned by the middle of the second century when the area was partitioned and given in concession to private individuals for the construction of tombs, both pagan and Christian. And this location today is now known as the Vatican Necropolis. Old St. Peter's Basilica was erected by Constantine over the site using some of the existing structure of the Circus of Nero. So again, like, you know, they're even using um, parts of the circus um, to build this necropolis where uh, there's Christian and pagan burials. So the Basilica was built so it's apse, which is a semicircular recess covered with a hemispherical vault or semi-dome in a church, and it was centered on St. Peter's tomb, but now it is beneath the high altar of the current St. Peter's Basilica, because it was rebuilt um, later on to the current one that stands now. So most of the circus survived until 1415, when they, or I'm sorry, 1450, when they were originally destroyed by the construction of new St. Peter's Basilica. So St. Peter, I'm sorry, St. Peter's Basilica's website states the following about uh, the St. Peter's Square Obelisk, which I feel like this is very, very telling. Um, As a pagan monument in the greatest <laughs> Christian square, it is a symbol of humanity reaching out to Christ. Originally inscribed to divine Augustus and then divine Tiberius and now dedicated to the Holy Cross, which they have in uh, Latin. It is topped by a bronze cross containing a fragment of the true cross. So again, we are just throwing all the pagan and Christian elements together here. And here you're seeing, you know, many other instances of religious syncretism, but it gets weirder. So St. Peter's Square is also a sundial. Um, the obelisk acting um, as a gnomon and its shadows mark noon over the signs of the zodiac in the white marble discs in the paving of the square. The obelisk rests upon four resting lines, each with two bodies whose tails intertwine. Now, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth pointed out the hidden timepiece during an uh, angelus address on the winter solstice. 
and here you can see I took a template of what's known as the Wheel of the Year. And the Wheel of the Year is an annual cycle of seasonal festivals by pagans, marking the year's chief solar events, uh, solstices, noxes, and the midpoints between them. So if you take a, a template of the Wheel of the Year like I did here and place it over St. Peter's Square, you see a perfect match and alignment. You know what I think is really interesting? The way the way this even lays down, like the image that you put on top of it. Mm -hmm. What I love about it is like the image that you're actually creating with that on top of it. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like a, uh, you know, steering wheel. Oh, especially yeah. for, mm -hmm. you know, or a target. Boat, a target. And I also think it looks like a lot, uh, the symbol that's sometimes used for the Wheel of Fortune. Mm -hmm. You know, and if this, yep. and I do think the Wheel of Fortune, if you have that experience or it goes along with the orphan in, in an extent. I think if you have that experience, you'll understand that it's all about time and space. Mm -hmm. So I find it very interesting that that even fits on something that they were saying was a clock. Yeah, I, it blew my mind because when I, I was looking at it, it goes back to the, um, uh, what is it? The, the solar cross, the eight armed solar cross which is what the um, Pagan Wheel of the Year was adapted from. So when I was looking at this, I, I had, you know, read in the past about the Wheel of the Year, and I was just, look, I looked at it, and I'm like, wait a second. And I got an image of the Wheel of the Year, a very simple one, and I placed it over top, and it fit perfectly. Now, I don't know the cardinal directions of, um, St. Peter's Square, so I might not have it on there where, you know, each um, each cycle or seasonal festival is supposed to be in, in according to uh, the, the way the year goes. But um, I was very taken aback that it fit like that. Mm. So, yeah. And then, yeah, that slide shows you how it works um, as the sundial with um, the equinoxes and the solstices. So, yes, very, very uh, interesting. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so I had mentioned a little earlier um, about the Vatican necropolis um, being underneath uh, St. Peter's Basilica. And it sits five stories below St. Peter's Basilica. It was adjacent to the circus on the southern slope of Vatican Hill. And during its inception, uh, Roman law forbade burial of the dead within its city wall. So that's why it ended up where it was. So it houses pagan and Christian burial grounds dating back to the first century AD. And it contains ruins of mausoleums and stone arches, along with a small dirt mound that's said to contain the bones of St. Peter. Other levels contain ancient frescoes, a maze of tombs, which are called scabby, and graves and even a 12th century church down there. Um, it, it's quite uh, an elaborate labyrinth. So the tunes were only discovered in the 1940s when expansions were being made to make room for the tomb for um, Pope Pius IX, who wanted to be buried as close to Peter as possible. And they do do, I guess, tours down here, but I think they're very limited and there's only access to certain points. Um, you can't see the entire um, necropolis. But what is most interesting to me regarding the tombs in Scabby is none other than tomb or Scabby U, which is titled Lucifer. And you can find this on St. Peter's Basilica dot info website. And this is an independent website, not endorsed or associated with the Vatican, but it's highly informative. Um, I found it interesting though, when I was looking at the um, scabby map, they uh, spell Lucifer differently than the traditional. The traditional is L U C I F E R. And on the map, um, which with each tomb listed, they spelled it L-U-I-C-F-E-R. Whether that's a typo or not, I'm not sure, but I that was, mm. you know, worth noting. So, but it's there. It's captioned a reduced tomb. You can see a small pic, uh, depiction of the light bearer, the morning star, and on the opposite wall there is a vesper, the evening star, cosmic symbols of the human life cycle. 
Now, you used to be able to see this on the Vatican's website under the Necropolis section. However, it, it appears to be an outdated Flash player version, so the page doesn't load. But I've seen people do YouTube's uh, videos on it when it was still functioning. Mm, you so, know, I'm wondering if you threw that into the Wayback Machine, if you'd be able to find snapshots of it on there. I, you probably could. I know there was one website I was looking at about um, the necropolis, and they were there was um, links for the Wayback Machine. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I tried loading it from my phone, my laptop, from different um, browsers, and it just it doesn't load. It's so, funny, I've actually... I mean, it starts to load, but like you only see the top where it says like Vatican Necropolis. I've come across like things like sometimes when I'm like looking for information on topics I want to cover. Sometimes I'll come across like a site or like a blog and like when they list their sources, I have seen like the Wayback Machine popping up more now because it's like, like oh, you yeah. got to use that in order to even show like where you're even getting this from because it's yep. not out anymore. Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing. I hope they don't ever take yeah. that away <laughs> um, because that, you know, being able to go back to – um, get information that's no longer accessible has been a, a, an enormous tool of help. So I hope that's not another thing that they decide at some point in time to scrub from the internet because I feel like we're in a, a modern day book burning with mm. things being scrubbed from the internet. So, and I feel like even books, again, are, there's like a, a modern day book burning. And I, I know I mentioned this to you on Amazon on William Cooper's book, Behold a Pale Horse, people were writing reviews and saying, this edition is different. It doesn't include this chapter. And people were even oh, wow. taking pictures of older editions with the missing chapter or missing information. So it's, it's interesting and also um, unsettling that so much information is being redacted. Yeah. Um, so I, I do feel, in a way, we're back in a modern-day book burning because of that. I agree. So I did want to um, touch on how the Vatican or the Roman Catholic Church, um, they have this tendency to build on top of ancient or sacred sites. You know, again, <laughs> they, they built St. Peter's Basilica, you know, on, you know, this necropolis between the city where St. Peter supposedly was um, or is. And, you know, they've done this all over the world. And one could argue this simply was the Christianization of sites that had once been pagan as a result of conversions on early Christian times, as well as an important strategy of what's called um, interpret. Let me hold on a minute. It's, this is Latin. Interpretatio Christiana, which means um, Christian reinterpretation. And it's an adaption of non-Christian elements or culture of historical facts to the worldview of Christianity. The term is commonly applied to recasting of religious and cultural activities, beliefs, and images of pagan peoples into Christianized form as a strategy. Now, when you're looking at that article on Wikipedia, Interpretatio Christiana. If you click on the link, Adaption of Non-Christian Elements, in the Wikipedia article, ladies and gentlemen, you are taken to religious syncretism, full circle. So this just oh, comes wow. all back around to that. Um, but, however, I would argue that the Vatican seems to be interested in these sites with a more um, clandestine agenda in mind. So, for instance, in 1544, the Spanish built the Catholic Church of San Pablo in Mitla, Wa oh, these Mexican words are hard, oh, um, okay. Oaxaca, Mex Mexico, on the location of an earlier Zapotec temple. So, oral historians have long suggested that the main altar of this church was purposely built over a sealed entrance to a vast underground labyrinth of pillars and passages that originally belong to a Zapotec temple known as Ly Lyoba, which means the place of rest. So investigating this claim with modern geophysical methods, the Project Lyoba research team announced on May 12, 2023, that they have found a vast and complex system of, of caves and passages, I'm sorry, passageways beneath the church. So you almost wonder if the 
the Roman Church or the, the Vatican is privy to this information of these sacred sites and maybe even knows something more than everybody else does. And what better way to claim the property than to build build your church right over top of it? Well, then it also gives you yeah. like just ways of like tunnels and transportation. It, yeah, and, and just access to who knows what 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 might be found down there. So yeah, and you are, know what? Go ahead. I hate to like even bring this up, but like I'm just saying, you know, calling it like it looks. I mean, this map mm-hmm. or this thing that I'm looking at right now, mm-hmm. it's like I feel like I've looked at this on the TV recently being told that this is the map of them going into Gaza in the tunnels. Oh, like, wow, it's like the same fucking crazy. thing I'm looking at right now. Mm, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> that's wild. I know if you were to think, if you just turn this to the, to an angle, that's the same mm-hmm. image. I'm constantly almost being shown about this tunnel system under Gaza. They got to go. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's not too far off. I'm like, yeah, it's just very weird. Yeah. So, and what's interesting about a, a lot of these places that, whether they're ancient sites or, or modern, um, but more so the ancient sites, you know, I was just on a podcast not too long ago when you were talking about caves um, with Alan Greenfield. And like Mammoth Cave is like, I think the second largest um, uh, cave system in the world, but God knows. I mean, there's parts of that that aren't even explored and who knows what's down there. You know, and and to me, I've always found that very creepy. But um, oh, I've thought about that. I was yeah. like, I mean, you know, they talk about how there's like people who live in the sewers or tunnels underneath the city. Like, mm-hmm. who the fuck knows? Yeah. It's really uh, down there. Yeah, and yeah, you go into um, like, um, you know, the mythology, like the Lemurians, you know, um, and the mythology or legend of, you know, them living underground and in um, mountains and, and, and things like that. Um, like Mount Shasta. But um, so one other site I wanted to talk about um, was one of the most incredible sites around Cusco, Peru. And it's, um, I'm going to try to say this right, Sacsayhuan, which it's a mighty temple and its walls seem to be have created by giant hands. And it's said that beneath Cusco and Sacsayhuan, miles of underground tunnels exist. And whoever tries to explore them dies, allegedly in terrible agony. And they are called the Chicanas and are said to lead to the Cori Concha. So the Incans um, and the richest temple they had was the Cori Concha Temple, with its gilded interior, and it was plundered by the Spaniards when the city was taken in 1533, and its structure destroyed by fire. In 1610, a church, Santo Domingo, was built above its foundation and has since served the Dominican order as a monastery. In 1650, the uh, covenant, um, I'm sorry, the convent completely collapsed and had to be rebuilt. But legend says that the Incas saved and hid the Cori Concha treasure when the city was conquered almost five centuries ago. The most valuable and sacred pieces of Inca gold were therefore hidden in underground halls accessible through the secret Chicana tunnels. In general, underground tunnels exist around Cusco. Some Chicanas, um, which is a native word meaning place to get lost, near Saxon and are known. They are mysterious caves and passages in the limestone rocks. Some parts of them can be visited, but most of the caves are kept inaccessible due to the danger of getting lost in them. Whether it was the Incas who built them or an older origin, little research has been done on it thus far, and they are undoubtedly vast and much still lies in the darkness of legend. And I watched an interesting documentary by Timothy Alberino and uh, Steve Quayle. Um, It was called the unholy sea and it touches on um, the Catholic church building on sacred sites, sacred sites. And they talk about Saxon Tawana and you know how, you know, it very well could have been before the Inca, um, uh, a location where Nephilim resided because the, you look at the structure of this ancient site and there's no mortar used for these ginormous blocks and they sit completely flush. And then it shows when the Incas came along, you know, their, I guess, you know, um, ancient masonry techniques 
it looks like crap. And then it shows the Spaniard, <laughs> the Spanish, and theirs is even worse. So they like show you how it's different. But I mean, and these things have like, you know, survived earthquakes and all kinds of crazy things. But there's something that area is very interesting, has a lot of unique um elements to it um that makes you kind of think you know about what the true history of that place is because they try to say that the incas did it and the incas were like oh, we didn't do that we built on or used it later but that's not us and you just there's no there would have been no technology even today with the size of these blocks to build you know this ancient yeah, site i don't i don't think we're talking about the same thing but there was something i seen recently where it was considered a really old site, and now they're realizing that it's actually like kind of on top of a foundation of something that's even older, and the mm -hmm. blocks are gigantic. Yeah, it they're like be. we. It there is be. no. I think they're even saying it might be like bigger pieces, or equivalent to like uh, Egyptian pyramid stuff. And they were like, "There's mm -hmm. no, there's no possibility of this." Yeah, like, it's crazy. No even idea. some of them on the corners, the way they molded them to the quarters, and they're still like flush. It's just incredible. I even was showing my dad, you know, about it, which a lot of times, like, he has no idea what the hell I'm talking about. But I was showing him, you know, pictures of this place. And he's like, that is wild. He's like, is this even real? He's like, is this AI? I said, no, it's not AI. I'm like, this is this is legit. And, you know, I know um, in Peru, they've also like L.A. Marzulli has been down there, too, um, you know, researching the elongated skulls. Um, so Peru definitely has a lot of interesting elements and, you know, high strangeness, um, that has yet to be, uh, uncovered. So the next topic, um, so I think that, yeah, I think the Vatican Catholic church definitely builds on these sacred sites for a particular purpose. Um, and to have access to these sites and what these sites may hold. And, you know, I think that could go beyond like, you know, something like gold. I think, you know, if there's like an, uh, you know, an ancient technology down there or a civilization that was more advanced, I mean, you can go into like the Nephilim and the watchers and everything that might entail. I definitely um, think uh, their purpose is something um they have a secret agenda so you know, or is it even just like a ahead. ley line or something that's like somebody knew prior that that was like a good area for for something else and they're just like mm -hmm. oh well, we want this too now oh for sure yeah definitely especially some of those sites you know they have um strange activity around them you know, for instance, you know, you have like Serpent Mound and there's, you know, UFO activity around, you know, mounds. Um, so I'm sure, you know, some of these sites, you know, um, the same thing happens. You know, I know the, I think it's, is it Mount Sherman that the Vatican has a telescope on with that binocular lens or whatever that's called Lucifer, yes. who they affectionately call Lucy. Um, yeah. you know, so it's like, why does the Vatican have such an I interest forgot about in, that. in space, you know, like, you know, it, I mean, that seems kind of, you know, out of their territory of, you know, religion. And so, I mean, that's just something very interesting. Um, so I, I think things like that definitely suggest that they're looking for something, um, and why they've become involved in places like that. So my next topic I wanted to start on was the Virgin Mary. And so the author Stephen Benko specializes in early Christianity and its pagan environment. And in his book, The Virgin Goddess, Studies in the Pagan and Christian Roots of Mariology, he traces the development of the cult of Mary from Greek and Roman mythology through recent times. And he traces Mary's roots to pagan pre-Christian heavenly queens of Greece, Rome, and the wider Mediterranean. Goddesses such as Demeter, Diana, Ishtar, Isis, and Selene. So quick side note on that, I never understood why Catholics would refer to Mary as the Queen of Heaven, um, given the scripture in Jeremiah, um, chapter 4, verses 17 through 21, where um, 
it says, we will do everything that we have vowed, make offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her. And the women said, when we make offerings to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, was it without our husband's approval that we make cakes for her, bearing her image and poured out drink offerings to her? Then Jeremiah said to the people, men and women, all of people who had just given him this answer, quote, as for the offerings that you offered in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, the Lord could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. It is because you made offerings and because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey the voice of the Lord or walk in his law in his statutes and in his test I'm sorry, statutes and in his testimonies that this disaster has happened to you as at this day. Now, scholars have attempted to pinpoint a single, uh, so I don't know what, um, okay, while scholars have attempted to pinpoint a single <laughs> deity behind this mysterious title, the Queen of Heaven, it's likely a combination of different deities throughout the Bronze and Iron Ages in the Levant, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the lands beyond. The Queen of Heaven may have referred to Isis, Ishtar, Asherah, Atherat, or Astarte. And I just think it's interesting that, I mean, in this biblical verse, they're, they're talking about the queen of heaven being a, a pagan god, goddess. Yeah, and it's evident because, you know, it talks about God disapproved of this. Why, why would you then give Mary that title? <laughs> I mean, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, you know, mm. that you would, unless you are suggesting she's the same thing. I mean, but I don't know. I find that very um, unusual. And I've always kind of questioned that because a lot of times the Catholics will be like, you know, the queen of heaven is Mary. It's not this terrible, uh, you know, pagan goddess, but in, in Jeremiah, it talks about referring to the queen of heaven as a pagan goddess. So why would you name something like that? Like that, that seems uh, you know, doesn't make sense, I guess, is what I I'm know, saying. So. I totally get what you're saying, yeah. <laughs> so that always kind of made me kind of go, hmm. So the cult with the greatest influence on early Christianity, according to Benko, was that of the Great Mother, known in Western Asia Minor as Cybele, which I had realized recently I was pronouncing wrong. I was saying Sybil, but it's Cybele. Consider the Great Mother of Gods and associated with motherhood, nature, fertility, and agriculture. She was to become the model of Mariology. So in Greek mythology, Cybele holds the key to the earth, shutting her up in the winter and opening her again in the spring. Similarly, similarly, similarly to Janus, who opens the door of the sky and releases the dawn. So this following excerpt I'm going to read is from um, the T Babylons or the worship or the papal worship proved to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife by Reverend Alexander Hislop, which I had bought this book. Um, I'm reading that I'm reading currently, but I have like so many other books and I'm trying to bounce all other kinds of research and um, I haven't gotten through it yet, but it is very interesting. But in his book, he quotes the keys that the Pope bore were the keys of a Peter well known to the pagans initiated in the Chaldean mysteries. The priest who explained the mysteries was Peter, known as the interpreter. Thus we may see how the keys of Janus and Cybele would come to be known as the keys of Peter, the interpreter of the mysteries. And um, I'm sure m much of your audience is um, familiar with the Chaldean mysteries, um, but if they're not, um, the Chaldean mysteries was a set of spiritual and philosophical texts widely used by Neoplatonist philosophers from the 3rd and 6th century. Um, original texts were lost, but fragments have been found that survive, and they primarily are concerned with ritual and thergy. But it's interesting <clears throat> that the Chaldean mysteries had a Peter, the interpreter and how the keys of Janus and Silo would become to known as the keys of Peter, the interpreter of the mysteries. So the term Cardinal is derived from Cardo meaning hinge Janus, whose key the Pope bears was the God of doors and hinges. It was only in the second century before the Christian era, the uh, Christian era that the worship of, Cybele under the same name was introduced to Rome, but the same goddess under the name of Cardia 
who was the goddess of hinges. With, quote, the power of the key, unquote, was worshipped in Rome along with Janus ages before. And both Janus and Cybill have been depicted as holding keys. Cybill is also depicted in the chariot being drawn by two lines or two lines surrounding her while seated. Now, this is something I came to, this a conclusion I came to on my own. However, there may be someone out there who has drawn the same conclusion as myself, um, but prior to me doing so, and I, I was, you know, and if that was the case, I was unaware of it. But if you look at St. Peter's Square, you will notice it's shaped like a keyhole. And in the middle of that keyhole is the obelisk. The obelisk has four sides to it, and each side has two lines resting on it. Is this an esoteric message? Does Cybele hold the key, the obelisk, in the center of St. Peter's Square being the key in the middle of the keyhole with her lines surrounding her? Or so, I mean, perhaps it's not even St. Peter we're talking about here, but rather mm. Peter the interpreter. So I don't know if you have that image to bring up um, of the lines. Yeah, right there. So there's two lines on each side of that obelisk. And Cybele was always depicted with two lines, whether they were laying beside her like that or drawing her chariot. So we're talking about the keys of Peter and, and how that can translate to possibly being not the, the keys of St. Peter, but the child being mysteries and uh, Peter the interpreter. And we're talking about Janice and Cybele mm. being the keys. Look. And then you have this obelisk in the middle which looks like a key kind of in the middle of a keyhole yeah, and it's surrounded by lions even if you go back to i think this is why i was stuck on this for so long because mm -hmm. i was like listening to what you were saying and thinking mm -hmm. about like that obelisk e even these keys that saint peter's holding i mean even that one you see at the top and even on the bottom it looks like the same thing on the bottom at the other end of the key it's like the same thing that's almost on the floor of the obelisk mm-hmm mm-hmm Yep, for sure. But, I mean, it's just another uh, very interesting element that, like, kind of just stood out at me. And I was like, this is this is wild. Like, because, I mean, this who's to say this isn't uh, an esoteric um, message? I think so. For those who are initiated... And it it's, means something completely different to them. Right. It's, and it's, yeah. And I feel like there's potential that this is a Babylonian religion um, that's just been cloaked in Christianity and religious syncretism. So, uh, yeah, I just, you know, that kind of blew my mind with that. So, um, yeah, that, but whole, going, that whole obelisk thing is just very, uh, it's very weird. It's very occult yeah. to me. I don't understand. I mean, why even I was even going to say this. This is. I mean, you're. I'm thinking now, going back to magic. There's four cardinal directions. We always. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about. I think, uh, like, kind of like a hinge on a door. Mm -hmm. If you'd laid out a cross and you put a hinge at the end of each side and flipped it like a door, you're mm -hmm. going to get a swastika, basically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 wild. Like there, there, and it seems like the more you look into this, the more connections you make. Um, and this is why this has become such such a project for me because it just is a labyrinth of la rabbit holes, and it, there doesn't seem to be any end to it. I just keep finding more stuff, and I I never even initially went into this saying. I'm going to look at Roman Catholicism, but naturally one thing I looked in led to the next. And then it's just continuously led me in all kinds of other directions. Like, and it, it's just become a beast of a research topic. Um, oh, sure. So, <laughs> I mean, even this but, whole thing right here makes me think a lot about again, like stuff with the eyeball and stuff that we were covering with the eyeball and how like it pulls out and across, but then screws closed. 
I mean, mm-hmm. that very much looks like, you know, just like a funny, uh, an, yeah. ex- an extra, uh, a very extra Phillips head screwdriver, really. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. But, I, and the thing is, I never understood, and I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, is I don't know why you would want to take a pagan monument or, or say just a religion um, where, say, one of your loved ones was executed and there's this monument there. Why would you want to put that monument in the middle of, you know, a religious center with the dark history associated with in the past. I mean, this was probably something, you know, Christians and anyone else executed in the circus of Nero was looking at why they died. And I just don't understand, you know, why it's, it just seems something dark to have. Like, I feel like if I had a loved one that was persecuted and executed and there is this monument, I'd want to destroy it. (laughs) Like, I'd want to smash it to, like, powder. I mean, they're they're smashing monuments now for, like, the wrong reasons. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, that is completely true. Supposedly (laughs) somewhere near my parents, there's a person that is, or an organization that's taking statues that are being taken down um, and housing them. Um, since mm. we're in a, in a, in a state today where people want to start taking down statues that were not erected necessarily for a belief system, but for a history purpose. And they're housing these statues. I, I'll have to see if I can you find know, out more information on that. You know, in a lot of statues, sometimes I, I do think like this architecture, I do think there is a occult symbolism on them. So it's like a, when I see stuff like this happen, I try like. I try not to like think about it, but I mean, I do see a connection to like even stuff like Hitler was doing. Mm-hmm. You know, people just wanted to collect occult artifacts. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, these, if some of these statues out there that we think, you know, I mean, I'm sure they're there for the reason that's engraved on it too. But I do think there's occultism mm-hmm. on a lot of them. You know, if you're trying to take those sure, down, and collect schedule. them, are you? Is it really any different than like what other people have done? I mean, other people have done that in other countries. Italy's done it. You know what I'm saying? We've done it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, other countries yeah. have gone mm-hmm. around and collected occult artifacts. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, or leaders, sure. And these could almost be wondered. They could almost be used almost as a sigil, too. You know, if they consist of any kind of occultic symbolism. So. Yeah, no, definitely for sure. So getting back to Mariology, throughout the region, many priests of the new Christian religion were recruited from among the pagan educated classes. And they were naturally and they naturally took their Greek philosophical ideas with them. The Stoic and Neoplatonic concepts of a mythological Earth Mother goddess were projected onto Mary with little adaption. So Mary assumed the functions of pagan female uh, divinities. And for many pious Catholic people, she did and does everything that the ancient goddesses used to do. Well, there, there was, uh, if, you know, I've seen going by, I guess, art and architecture and timelines and other areas of the world where it pops up. I do think there's significant evidence that Mary was also used in areas where there was pagan female goddesses that were kind of prevalent. It was like, oh, well, here's a new one for you instead. Mm -hmm. Instead Instead of ISIS, we got Mary for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I think, you know, it's, you know, besides, I mean, just with everything I presented, do you wonder if, a, was this a way to kind of placate the pagans and be like, come to our side, we can still have, you can still have this. It's pretty much the same thing. It might be called something it's different, different, but it's pretty look. much the same it's thing. Look. So you're not really giving it up. And um, in later episodes, you know, I can talk about, you know, um, some of the feast days um, or, or holidays. Like, I mean, Jesus wasn't born in December. He was born likely in September (laughs) and with Christianity and stuff um, and and Constantine and stuff, they decided, well, we're going to make it now because, you know, this coincides with Saturnalia and Sol Invictus. Um, 
you know, so it kind of still gives them what they're used to and kind of convinces them, well, maybe it's not so bad. You know, we'll try it because we can, we can keep these things, you know, but at the same time, you think some of those things would be phased out, you know, now that they got past, like, you know, the, where the time period where most people were predominantly pagan pagans. So, but these elements still run strong. Um, so then you began to wonder, okay, was there another agenda at hand? Was this almost this religion, religious syncretism, not so much, or maybe both, you know, trying to convince the pagans to come over, but also, um, you know, a Babylonian religion cloaked in Christianity. It's hard to say, but there's a lot of, um, kind of contradictory, uh, I think so. information you will find. And that's, you know, that all goes back to that religious syncretism, this blending of elements. And I said, I know like this probably would upset a lot of Catholics to hear this. And I'm not saying that Catholics aren't Christians. I'm saying like the beginning of this religion could have had different intentions. Um, and you know, I'm sure if it did people, high up in the Vatican would know that, but you know, only a select few, only the initiated. Um, but it's something worth looking at. Um, I think so. Yeah. And then the fact like, I, 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 I touched on this on subconscious realms, but even if you don't want to le- even humor any of this, that's fine. The thing, and I am a, I am a Christian. I'm speaking from a Christian perspective. Um, I don't really, associate myself with any denomination. I don't feel like I, I need to. Um, so, but the, I think the biggest thing that upsets me about, um, the Roman Catholic church is the purposeful covering up of the pedophilia mm-hmm. because it's been proven that they knew about it. And for many years they did the, you know, Just keto shuffle. shuffle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, keto. and, I think for me, if I was Catholic, and I mean, I guess, you know, if you want to remain Catholic, well, hell, go to the Orthodox Church. Like, I I don't know, like, to know, I would have a real hard problem staying with an organization that purposefully covered it up and denied it and continues to deny it to this day and treats victims like trash. Um, So, you know, Again, I'm not picking on the Catholic Church, but there's some very, I think there's some things that need to be looked at um, and considered. You know, again, even if you're uh, Catholic, okay, that's fine. Um, But you don't have to associate yourself with, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. You can still be Catholic, but I, I just present this evidence and research and people can, you know, come to their own conclusions Again, I'm not saying this is what's going on because I have no idea what the hell is going on, to be honest. I don't think anybody does. No. But it is, you should look at information like this when it's suspect um, instead of just, you know, taking, you know, um, whatever's fed to you as truth. Um, I think so many of us walk around with you know, our eyes closed. And if we kind of just opened them a bit and did our own little re- bit of research, didn't always nice. subscribe to social media. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the uh, mainstream media yeah. or social media. Yeah. I mean, you should, you know, anything on social media, you should fact check yourself too, <laughs> or any, any kind of um, resource. Um, I look at like tons of different resources before I like when I'm doing my notes and stuff, because I, you know, a lot of times we'll see contradictions and stuff like that. But if we were more aware and weren't so much in just this autopilot, I think we'd see a lot of things for something they're not. Mm-hmm. So instead of, you know, just taking whatever, you know, agenda is being fed to you or whatever, I think it's healthy to question things um, and just not, you know, accept everything as truth because. It, it, the world we're living in today, there's a lot of, uh, you know, 
suspect things going on. Propaganda. And, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, with the whole propaganda, we know um, Operation Mockingbird happened. And then you got the 2012 Smith Munt Act, um, Modernization Act of 2012 that Obama signed, which says we can be fed propaganda. Yeah, yeah, again. Yeah. So, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, but again, you learn these things when you start looking into the, these things. And then you'll see a lot of the, um, you know, bits and pieces of the puzzle that don't connect like you were being told they should. So I think you said it the best when I mean, it's just, uh, and I even think sometimes like that's what it's really going to come down to, uh, especially nowadays. You just cannot believe everything or you shouldn't just take everything as it's handed to you. You have to be your own little detective nowadays and you actually have mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, look into and just not blindly accept. Right. Yeah. And again, I'm presenting this evidence to people so they can do their own research that, so they yeah. can look themselves and, you know, come to their own, you know, conclusion. I'm just showing you what I buy. I've come across and maybe you'll build on that or maybe you'll find something different, but yeah. you know, there, you know, these are it, it, things in this world weren't being looked at a second time. Um, and I think the w things would be very different in this world if people kind of did their own research and kind of not took everything, um, as being truth. I think there'd be a lot of things discovered, um, that would suggest otherwise. And I think that would put us in a better position as well. Very well said. Very well said. Well, thank you very much, Nick. I would assume that this is uh, pretty much all you got for this uh, this for, episode. Yes, for this one, for yes. this one. So, and, and, and I yeah, did there's think quite I a bit more to tackle. <laughs> I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, so I'll mention it now. This will probably most likely be a two-part series. I know I was going to have her come back on and do more. So uh, there should be another part eventually of this. Um, I'll probably release them back to back. So. Uh, try and, to... you know, a lot of history was covered on this one, so um, we'll probably get into a little bit more modern day stuff, too. But, again, I needed to cover a lot of the history, especially um, going back to Constantine. Oh, I think that was so, great. Yeah, so you have a better idea of what's going on from the very beginning and how it's all kind of continued to, to transpire across the timeline. You know, it was one thing I even uh, found interesting, something I came across, and I was just like, Jesus. You know, uh, and I just think it's kind of, it's, it's it's interesting, especially with what we're covering here, and don't want to get into it too much, because it's uh, won't drop for a few weeks, haven't even recorded it yet, but someone that I'm going to cover was an occultist, and they were, like, close to, and, um, like, talking to one of the people that were in charge of, like, how the St. King, no, how the King James Bible was going to get translated into English. <laughs> I actually, um, that's you know, and there part. was an occultist we, who was very close yeah, to someone. We will somebody. talk to, yeah. we will talk in the future episode about William Tyndale, who translated, um, and his translation is used, um, is pretty much derived from the King James and used in the King James to this day, how the Catholic church and Henry the eighth burned, um, uh, executed him because the church was mad that he translated it from the Latin Vulgate into English. Cause that was punishable by crime. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Because right. they didn't want anybody reading it because then he was pointing out uh, they were interpreting scripture not in the correct way. So he pissed in their Cheerios and they were very upset about that. And <laughs> that's what I'll get into um, on a future episode and how awesome. I look forward he met to that his one demise now. because that was during the um, Protestant Reformation. Um, he kind of did the same thing that Martin Luther did, but Martin Luther... Um, translated into German so he trained he was translating into English I mean back then even um teaching your children parts of the Bible or like uh certain prayers and stuff could be punishable by death so that's um that is definitely something we'll be getting into is the translation of um of the Bible at least the King James version awesome I look forward to that definitely <laughs> uh thank you very much again for coming on whenever you do it's always a solid yes, episode you. uh you know, like I was telling people before, I'm always happy to have you on. I, you, you bring slides. You brought, you know, uh, for people that are listening, if you want to, you can go back. I would suggest to watch the video. That was even another thing I forgot to mention at the beginning. There was slides in here. She brought, you know, you know, things to look at to what she was referring to. 
I love that. I thought it was great. And uh, again, you just brought a lot of information. Uh, yeah, and you. even if you don't want to watch, like if you listen to it and don't want to watch the whole video, again, you can at least, you know, scroll through, fast forward through until the parts, you get to the pictures. That way, you know, you can look at the picture or the slide and, you know, kind of, you know, put together uh, what I was talking about with I, that slide. Yeah, I definitely think this episode is uh, worth looking at the uh, illustrations. So if you can, definitely check it out. Uh, thank you again so much, Nix. I appreciate your time and you trying to squeeze this in before you go do the things you got to take care of now. <laughs> I really appreciate you making it possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there will be a, uh, there'll at least be a part two. So keep yeah, an oh, eye sure. out for I, that. I can't make any promises that it's going to stop there because it just keeps going. Oh, listen, we'll keep going. I'll keep going with mm -hmm. you. So, you know, as long as, as many as it takes, I'm definitely interested in covering this. Uh, and that is the end of another NY Patriot show. Uh, her links will be in the bottom as usual. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.